Hello, hello. Welcome everyone. It's Rebecca Schistler Marshall and I'm here again with Aaron Sheriff and we're here for the Vibrant Wild and Free series again. Episode two. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so welcome. Welcome Aaron and I'm so glad that we're here um, talking again today and today we're going to be talking about mindfulness you know our um this series is called the vibrant wild and free series and that's leading up to our vibrant wild and free retreat that we have in mexico this year so we wanted to talk a little bit about mindfulness because that's a big part of both of our lives and it's incorporated into the schedule during the retreat and so we wanted to have a little conversation about mindfulness and what that how mindfulness is a gateway into leading a vibrant, wild, and free life. Absolutely, absolutely, Rebecca. And we were kind of brainstorming and heartstorming this episode and discussing between ourselves, why is mindfulness so important? And one of the main things that we came up with is that the default mode of society is not a vibrant, wild, and free life. It's <laughs> oftentimes the opposite yeah. of that. And because it's become normalized, many times we don't even see that there are other choices. And mindfulness as a practice allows us to drop below that drama and that noise of the culture to see a little bit more clearly and progressively more clearly over time. I think the more years you practice, Maybe that some of these things that we've assumed to be true and solid are not so much. Yes, I love that, right? But maybe the things that we've assumed to be true is not necessarily the case. And that, you know, that's one of the biggest pieces for me that when I see, you know, especially for my clients, I see my clients struggling to live that vibrant life that they want. And they wonder why life has to be so filled with drama. <laughs> and it's like, guess what? It doesn't have to be. That's the, that's like the good news, right? It doesn't have to be. Yes, it doesn't have to be. And I wanted to look up, Rebecca, because you and I decided on these words, vibrant, wild, and free for the retreat and the series, and they resonated deeply with each of us, but we didn't necessarily hash out what each of the words mean. mean. So I looked them up to see what they mean and how, it, how mindfulness relates. And so for, I love that. for vibrant, the definition of vibrant, or the main definition that I found is pulsating with life. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> right? And that kind of surprised, it surprised me a little bit. It wouldn't have been how I maybe would have defined it. Yeah. But I love it because the pulsating, the pulsating to me, it's, it's something active. It's something that's happening. It points yeah. towards the energy body, the unseen world, which is something yes. that both you and I play in. Yeah. And so, so mindfulness as a way to encourage vibrancy mm. and including that energy body and the pulsation. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Rebecca. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I love energy. I think it's one of the primary pieces that people, um, you know, we aren't taught about in our society. It's not something that we're raised with or taught about. And you know, I think mindfulness affects not just the energy body. Like when we have that, I love that pulsing with, was it pulsing with life? Is that what it was? Yes. Yeah. And it's like, so it's not just like, oh, I have a lot of energy. It's pulsing with life, which feels so full and dynamic instead of just like, oh, I can go and do really vibrancy full of life can be resting dynamically, can be, you know, moving dynamically, it can be active, it can be um, peaceful, it can be calm. So that's, that feels to me, I mean, that's what I feel mindfulness is. Sometimes people think mindfulness is, well, you're sitting still on a cushion or, you know, 
in a meditation cushion or in whatever way. And I think it's so much more than that, right? It's mindfulness while you're running, <laughs> while you're driving. I finished, um, when I finished the MBSR training with John Cabot zinn and Saki Santorelli, at the very end of the retreat, I was to fly home to get ready for my wedding. And there was like, you know, there's all this stuff that was happening in the four or five days leading up to the wedding. And I didn't want to miss my plane. <laughs> I remember running through the airport and breathing and being as present as I could in my body and not in the story about what could happen. You know, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss my plane. It was like, I'm just, I would like to make my plane. I feel my heart beating. I feel my muscles moving, I feel the heaviness of my luggage, <laughs> you know, instead of the worry. And it was so um, vibrant. It was so freeing instead of being stuck in the drama. Yes. And that points to something really important, I think, Rebecca, which is that mindfulness makes space for everything. You can be yeah. vibrant in the middle of missing your flight. You right. can be vibrant in the middle of a challenging communication. You can bring that vibrancy into anything and everything. It doesn't have to look a certain way. Yes. And you mentioned the word freedom. Rebecca. And so I think there is a certain, and this is a phrase I heard on my last retreat and it really resonated with me. It's, this is a liberative practice. It's a liberative Ooh, process, meaning it points more and more towards freedom. No matter what is happening in the outside world, we're choosing, we have access to a certain inner state and a certain pulsation of life that allows us to show up in potentially new and different ways, no matter what's going on around us. Yeah, no, so that, and that comes back to, right, no matter what is going on around us, such, which is the whole point of mindfulness, right? Being in full awareness without judgment. So we're not judging missing a flight or the conversation that's being had about us <laughs> or whatever, how, or how, the, how the video recording goes, all of those things. We're just being aware, like, hmm, isn't that interesting? Isn't that um, you know, it's curious, like, I'd like to know more about that. Or maybe, maybe I don't want to know more about that. But all of that is without the judgment that most of the time, a lot of us is kind of, as you said, at the beginning, that's the default, right, that we're judging what's happening instead of no matter what's going on around us. I love that. Yes. Yes. So, so that's the vibrancy and that's how we could obviously spend hours and hours talking about <laughs> how mindfulness contributes to this vibrancy. But I think for now, those are some important seeds to be planted. Do you, do you have anything else you want to say about that? No, I think that's, I think you're right. We could talk about it. And as you can tell, both of us um, feel a great deal of power behind mindfulness, that that's a very important piece for both of us in our lives. So you can kind of tell that we're not just, you know, it's something that we try to live, both of us. I know that I do. And I'm, from what I see in Erin's life, I know that she does. <laughs> so <laughs> we're both, um, you know, it's not just a concept to us. It's right. a way of life. Yeah. Right. And so I, I'm, guessing we'll get to more of the layers around this as these episodes progress. But I think I will now define what I found for wild. Oh, yes. I can't wait to hear. Which is living in a natural state with natural characteristics, not tamed. Not tamed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Rebecca, I would love to hear your thoughts around, around this concept of wild. Yeah, wild to me. You know, it's interesting because, you know, uh, you know, part of the reason that we're doing this series is that I adore you so much. And, <laughs> and when I think of wild, I think of you. Oh, and I, <laughs> I think of the untamed way. So I think that's, it's really something that, um, you know, for me, I'm still evolving into of like how to live in a way where there aren't those, um, you know, where it is more natural, where it's not just a constrained, uh, you know, case put on me by someone else, that it's more about, well, what, what is the flow? What wants to happen? What is the natural progression of things? 
either in a situation or in this life or out in the world, you know, I just adore nature and I'm always looking to it for clues about, well, how do, how can I live my life like the trees or like the river or, um, so I love that. That's the wild piece that really, you know, speaks to my heart. Mm -hmm. And when I started thinking about this and how we have become tamed, there's so many ways that we just don't even think about and we just assume because everyone else is doing it, that it's okay and that it's normal. But even, you know, eating at certain times, you eat at this time, you eat at that, especially if you're at work and you're in an office and here's the lunchtime that you get or when we're in school, it starts as little kids. Yeah. You're going to eat lunch at noon, whether you're hungry or not. So we learn to override our natural instincts at a very early age. Yeah. And you can argue that, okay, there's good reasons for that. Everybody has to eat at the same time or it's chaos, but okay. But then we are, there's a price to that. And there's a cost to that, that if it's never even discussed or noticed is just one more point of disconnection within ourselves. And it, were you going to say something? Well, no, I just love that word disconnection within ourselves or that phrase. I think it's, that's really, um, I think that does get to the heart of the wild part, right? That that's when we're connected with ourselves, then, um, you know, some of that drama that we were talking about before with a vibrancy tends to go away. Right. Right. And then there's so many either small or not so small points of disconnection where we've become tamed. I mean, the other creatures of the world, we are just biologic creatures. Yeah. Um, they may change their behavior because of what the moon is doing or because of what season we're in or because of some of these natural rhythms of nature. Whereas we as humans have created a culture where we kind of think that we can override all of that and we have um, in many cases, but again, it just, it comes at a cost and it may be something valuable to look at through a practice like mindfulness and just sitting and asking these deep questions and being with ourselves through seasons, through phases of the moon, through times of the day, and just checking in and seeing what's natural here, what's yeah. actually here and present for me. Am I hungry right now? I'm about to eat. Am I really physically hungry or am I eating for some other reason? Again, not with judgment, but just with complete curiosity about what's going on and why and how. And then through some sustained attention to these processes and the choices that we're making, we can then discern, okay, what's, what's the best choice here? What's the right. wisest choice for me right now? Whereas without that investigation, we may not even know that there are other choices that we can make. Yes. And I think what you're pointing to is this, um, it's kind of like the difference between internal and external, right? The external tells you what to do, when to do it. And the internal is, well, what do, you know, what, what's arising right now? What do, I, what would I like to do right now? What, what feels in alignment for me, which is again, not something that we're typically asked in this particular culture of, you know, gosh, I don't really, um, I don't really feel like doing math at this time. I'm actually much more, um, you know, going back to the school, I'm much better at doing math calculations in the afternoon. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it that then instead. And we just don't have that option often. Right. Um, when we have these external, I mean, we do have the option if we choose to. So I love that being mindful of it. What is my internal, what's my inner voice? What's my inner wisdom saying to me? And am I willing to listen to it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's why retreats for me are so important. And I do a, an extended retreat at least once a year to break out of the routine and to be not only given permission to, but encouraged to investigate everything. Yeah. So yeah, that inquiry is so important, right? It's a, it's a skill and a practice of not just inquiring with your thoughts, but inquiring about, you know, everything that's going on around you. And I love that you were saying that that's such a, you know, it's a deep looking internally, um, that can be really beneficial. Mm, absolutely. And it is a skill and a practice. It's not something that just drops from the skies and, you know, <laughs> it now counteracts decades and decades of conditioning. It's a, it's very much 
a skill and a practice. And, and it's encouraging a deep intimacy, I think, with, with yourself and, yes. and your own vibrant life, vibrant, precious right. life. So, right. yeah. yeah. So, so that's the wild. Do you want to have anything else to say about the wild, Rebecca? No, I think that, that, I love that. How you ended it was perfect. Okay. And then the free is not under the control of, of another. Mm. And so why, so in my head, wild and free were a little bit intermingled and, and they are, but they're also distinct things because we can be free, but not wild because we're taming ourselves. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on free, Rebecca, not under the control of another. Yeah, you can be, so let's see, not under the control of another. And I feel like, you know, it is, it's challenging for me too, because I do think of them as going together. But if you're free from these, you know, not being under the control of others, but you still place those unnatural tendencies on yourself by yourself, <laughs> then you're not under someone else's control. So you could be free, but still not be wild. Um, I'm just wondering, can you, can it be the other way around? I don't think it's possible to be wild and not free. Is it? Do you think? Well, I thought about that and I thought of a wild tiger in a cage um... he or she could still be wild even though they don't have freedom to choose their own movement so that was the one example i thought of where that could be oh, true that's pretty good right so we can be and so we can be free of societies well uh, yeah i'm kind of going back to how we were talking about drama and the stories right the stories that we have in our lives but maybe that's more wild i might be getting them mixed up now <laughs> But, um, you know, we have the stories that keep us in place about how beliefs that we have that can, that can keep us um, still under the control of others in that way that you were saying you could be free, but if you've taken on that belief from parents or the school system or your former business office and you leave the actual workplace, but you still have those beliefs that, oh, um, uh, things have to be done a certain way, that um, there's scarcity, there's not abundance in the world, then you can still be look free, but not actually be free. Um, and that's, that's really interesting to me too, how that happens for, for a lot of us. Right. Yeah. That's a really interesting to think about, right? That even in the circumstances that you can still be free, that goes back to the, what, um, what's going on internally for you is what really makes the difference. And that's where mindfulness plays such a huge role or connection with, you know, as you were saying, whether or not he was mindfulness, that connection with, um, the spirit of peace and love and generosity. That's right. And the, the, just the pulsing with life, that that is always a choice, no matter what is going on around you. See what I can access. Right. Oh, I love that. What amazing practice to have, right? That, I mean, it's, again, building a muscle of practicing it. Um, I think that's something, you know, it just kind of occurs to me that that may not be as easily accessible in the beginning for people and people may think, oh, I'm, you know, they may label again, put a story on how they're not good at that or they'd never be able to do that. And I think that just an encouragement for anyone listening who hasn't been able to access that yet, um, that it is just a reminder that it is that a practice and it's like a muscle that you have to get stronger with time and it only gets stronger the more you use it. So, um, just don't beat yourself up is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> That's good advice. That's good advice, Rebecca. And, and also for the people, I have so many students that come and they say, well, I'm not good at this, or I didn't have a good practice, or as if there's some end point where, okay, I'm mindful now and it's my, I'm always going to have a stable mind and everything's going to be fine. No, that's why it's called a practice. Right. And right. it's just about showing up and putting the time in on the cushion, so to speak. We do need to 
have that time where we do sit and just dedicate time to practicing the skill so that when we are out in the world, it's more easily accessible. So there's no good practice. There's no bad practice. There's just being willing to show up and see what happens. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so beautifully said. Just willing to show up and see what happens because you know, as one of my teachers would say, we, you know, you sit on the cushion when it's quiet and it's still and there's nobody around or in a chair or whatever works for you or walking mindfulness or, you know, all of those possibilities. You do it when it's quiet and it's still to practice for when things are chaotic and crazy and not as easy um, so that you do have that. You don't just wait until things get really <laughs> filled with drama and then say, now would be a good time to start mindfulness. So if things are going smoothly, this is the exactly perfect time to start mindfulness. And if things are rough, it's the exactly perfect time to start with mindfulness. <laughs> so well put. So well put. Well, maybe that is a good place to end as an invitation for people to either recommit to their mindfulness practice if you've gotten away from it or to start one. And if we can be helpful to you, we're going to put links in um, the area below, wherever you are watching this or listening to this, to find us. You can have a free call with either of us, or I have a seven-day mindfulness challenge. You get short practices in your inbox every day for seven days that you can sit and listen to. Rebecca, do you want to speak to um, your other offering? Yeah, yeah. I have a an everyday mindfulness course that I teach that it's a do it yourself. It's a four week um, course, videos and audios on mindfulness. That's $39. So it's, um, so start with Erin's seven day challenge for sure. And try, um, she's an amazing, I mean, that's such an amazing offer to have seven days of mindfulness come to you in your inbox. Um, you know, how great is that to be able to just start without having to go anywhere, you just receive it. So <laughs> give yourself that gift to start learning mindfulness if you don't already, or if you already have a practice and you'd like a little reminder of how um, beneficial mindfulness can be, uh, either one of those offers are um, a great way to jumpstart your mindfulness practice. Hmm. Thank you, Rebecca. And I think both of us just want to see a more vibrant, wild, and free world. And so that, I think I can speak for Rebecca when I say that's behind the intention for a lot of what we create and offer. So if there are other ways we can support you, if you have specific questions around any of this, please reach out. And when we come together next time for episode three, I'm very, it's a topic that I really love. And then I think I kind of take it for granted as a concept, but I say it and oftentimes people react in surprising and really interested ways. So our topic is going to be what wants to happen. <laughs> yes, I love it. Yes, that's not something that usually comes about um, in the academic faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> what wants to happen and it speaks to this um, piece of mindfulness that we've been talking about so we're kind of be building on what we've been talking about with mindfulness um, and asking that in your own life too yes yes so I can't wait and until then Yay. be well thank you Rebecca thank you Erin it's so good to talk to you again you and we'll see you soon